Episode 10. We made it to 10. Double digits, right? I, I just to start using toes. Waited on me to get to 10. Yeah, well, it was, this was like the big drop. Who do we have in, in-house, I'm right? I'm surprised you could count to 10. <laughs> Who said I got could? Got a calculator. I got to out. sit there and they number them for me on the yeah, podcast. I mean, you're kind of an engineer. I'm a retired engineer. Retired engineer. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Wife you calls just me literally a stole Trey's line. Wife calls me a recovering engineer. Oh, oh that's true. true. Not retired. Yeah, it's not true. retired. I'm like that dude that made the practice squad and got cut and went into retirement. So, um, what dude was that? Like every person with aspiring NFL dreams. Huh. So everybody that plays for the Packers. <sighs> Calm down. <now. laughs> oh man! All right, taking shots, and maybe we don't want Trey for episode ten. Trey, right here, we got in the studio with us for the first time. We have a guest actually here in the studio. Uh, Jim Grant. It is. It really is. We've got Trey Smith with us. Uh, he works as the product manager with Tomco Systems, and we're excited to have you here. We're going to dive into how CO2 is used in the food and beverage market, specifically beverage. Uh, and you can tell that we're shooting this episode before lunch because we thought, what do we want to talk about? I'm a little hungry today. Let's talk about food. Food and beverage. Absolutely. So, Jeff, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, food? Dude, I'm a little nervous this episode, so I'm going to rub both of your heads no, for a lot. I got the two bald You're guys in like saving <laughs> So, as we've talked about before, food and beverage makes up roughly 70% of the use and utilization of CO2 in this country. Now, it's really pretty simple where it's used in, in beverage, right? It carbonates our soda, so it is, is in good. I could have grabbed it. Soda yeah, can, I know, but that was my nod to the Oh, yeah. there it is. It is in good. Don't edit that. Anyway, so <laughs> obviously, but the majority is used in food processing. So, you know, for, for those of you in the food business that are following us, you, you probably know most of them. But Trey, run us through. Where do we use CO2 today in a food processing, meat, poultry, seafood? Where, where's the major utilization of CO2? So it, it's literally from the start of the process to the end of the process. Uh, whether it's stunning the livestock coming into the plant all the way to uh, using the CO2 to to chill the meat as it's going through a mixer, uh, through a freezer, uh, final product going through, and then all the way to the packaging going out the door. So they'll put pellets, snow, um, some tor- some type of uh, extra cooling on top of the packaging before it leaves the plant going out to the their final customer. Yeah, so at the end of the day, what happens if you, uh, we've all talked about shortages, what happens if you don't have CO2? Uh, you don't have a uh, good product. I mean, so, so that's, you I don't have, think you have a plan. You, you don't have like 2,000 people standing around. Well, going, that's the big thing, right? Yeah, you just shut the plant down. This, shut the plant down. You're, you're in a temperature-controlled environment, but that's still not enough to accomplish what is needed. You have to have the CO2 medium. You've got some out. transit of that product either within the plant or outside of the plant into a truck, uh, into a truck going to another storage facility. So, yeah, there is some transportation in there where the product needs that extra bit of uh, chilling if it's not in a controlled environment. So I guess like a nice visual, right? A lot of delivery, home food delivery right now is taking place. And so maybe a lot of our listeners have experienced that. Uh, you have the refrigerated packs, but also frozen dry ice there. So kind yeah. of same thing happening at a large scale within these plants, essentially. You're right. using that CO2 to cool that feed. Ex- that, that exactly. Ice. Same thing on a more of a commercial scale versus the uh, individual users. Hmm. Right. Out, yeah, out, like out. what they call combo boxes. These are on the dimensions but they weigh about roughly 2,000 pounds of meat layered or mixed in with all sorts of dry ice in there to, sh- to transport it from where it was processed or going to the processing plant so from the harvesting plant to the processing plant and, and everywhere in between so, yeah yeah so so given all that so obviously I mean yeah the bottom line is it's critical to our food supply so you do it's critical to our food supply so we've talked about it being a critical ingredient well, this is critical to the manufacturing process. And like I said, if you don't have CO2 and we're experiencing shortages across the Southeast right now, I've heard of plants being shut down. I've heard of a rail car of CO2, which is about 80,000 pounds of CO2 from the West Coast to the East Coast, costing upwards of $250,000, where it used to be, you know, could be one one hundredth of that on a you know given day yeah. prior to that. So crazy numbers right now, because again, it's the opportunity cost. You shut a plant down and have 2,000 people standing around with nothing to do, uh, you got your million, millions of here. dollars versus yeah, a quarter million, million yeah. per shift. Yeah. So, given that, what what trends are we seeing in the in the food processing business in the industry in these plants? Well, I think you know, for years and years, you've seen plants tackle any problem with headcount. You know, they can throw more people at it. Labor was cheap. CO two was cheap. Uh, the, that doesn't exist anymore. You know, it's harder to find uh, 
you know, staff that can, that can do, uh, you know, higher level tasks within the plant. Uh, so the cost of, of the employee has gone up. Uh, the cost of CO2 has gone up. So there's, there's a huge trend towards automation. Uh, anything you can do, do to reduce headcount. So what we're seeing in a lot of plants now is, is a focus on just that. What can we automate uh, to reduce headcount and increase efficiency? Uh, and one of those, one of those is a good example is our new snow hood. So we take a lot of these plants will use bins of pellets, hand scooped. We, we joke that it's a calibrated scoop. But That's you've got common. these boxes coming down the line. I know and there's a, when I scoop, I always get the same amount every time. That's right. That's yeah, I do nugget ice, and I hit like 56 pieces of nugget ice in every scoop. It's got science. Yeah, oh yeah. Like chick fil ice. I do it with my ice cream. You know, it's it's a little <laughs> deeper scoop for me. For, uh, right. So, uh, but that's it's it's a part of the process. It's not controlled either. So, depending on who's working the line, who's scooping ice out of the bin into the boxes. That could be one pound. It could be half a pound. It could be two pounds. Right. There's there's no control over what goes in that box. So what's the snow? We talk about a snow. What does, what does that look like? Then? What are we doing? So it's it's a, an extension to an existing conveyor system going through the plant. So as those boxes come through, uh, it hits a limit switch inside the box, dumps a given amount of snow in the box, and the box box passes on through gets palletized and then off to secondary customers so basically for we're process just, we're automating the the production line basically and like you would in any production line right but eliminate it, head count eliminate manpower and save co2 save co2 because yeah you're well you get the yeah. same dose every time as opposed to what we're talking about this right. Week, right every time you never know what you're really truly getting other other thing with pellets so you you're not ordering a these food plants aren't ordering a bin of pellets they're ordering a truckload of pellets so that truckload sits out in the parking lot for a given number of days. So you've got roughly 10% per day being lost through sublimation out in this trailer that's sitting, if it's a summertime, it doesn't matter if it's summer or winter, the pellets are, you know, negative 110 degrees. So whatever that te temperature differential is, it's, it's the same, you know, sublimation rate, whether it's summer or winter. So. Sublimation picture, like that fog coming across the dance floor of some horrible nightclub kind of right is there a horrible dance floor <laughs> you're yet to find one right? <laughs> so, <laughs> if you saw me dance it's a horrible dance no, club no, yeah. <laughs> if i'm there it's a horrible <laughs> dance club yeah, yeah, yeah so basically I mean, if you buy fifty thousand pounds of, of dry ice a container whatever a whole load of it you're saying every day you're losing eight to ten percent of that ice and every i day. have no doubt that these employees at these uh, facilities are using the first in first out method every single time no doubt yeah so. uh and and i've walked through plants before where there's a, a bin of ice that just comes fresh off the truck you know it's no telling how long it sat out on the truck but they take the lid off and it's literally 25 percent full so that that was that was paid for you know but never never had the opportunity to get used pulling from the front they probably think they got five ten bins that just showed up empty by the time it's yeah, that's right. sublimated away. Very well, good. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Well, and especially after, you know, day three, that starts to turn into kind of a block of ice and not pellets anymore. So they right. really don't like dealing with that one. Now you got to break it up. And I'm sure the consistency stays the same. So, and there's so, never going to, nobody's ever going to get the last yeah, bit of sure, ice sure. down in the bin. So there's just a huge amount of waste so basically, with pellets versus a, a snow hood that you're literally only, you're on only demand. dosing what you yeah. need on demand. On demand. Exactly. Yeah, that's I like that, that def definition of it. That's great. So what I heard you say is that the biggest issue of trends that you're seeing is manpower, labor shortages, CO2 shortages, and and uh, pricing and cost controls at the plants themselves by right. the, by the producers. I love one. By my uh, my my chicken is uh, used to be you know seven ninety nine a pound. Now it's eight ninety nine a pound. You know these guys are killing it, right? I mean the the food processors are making tons of money. Not necessarily. Yeah. Well, that's what we're wondering. I mean, you assume that big corporations price gouging, but uh, I mean, is there a chance that they're actually making less than they were? Pre-COVID, it's not OPEC, right? It's it's different in no. the poultry and beef industry. <laughs> yeah, I think that's that's really, I mean, one of the true trends that we're seeing is is uh, especially I've seen a lot in the poultry. Uh, again, red meat is is definitely they're maintaining some of their margins, but I've heard all sorts of stories around poultry market is definitely seeing a constraint in their margins. And you see some stock price pressures on on uh, some of these. Uh, I don't know if you saw the news recently. Tyson Food just last week, I believe announced they're consolidating all of their corporate headquarters into one location in Arkansas. Again, I don't know for sure if that's driven by cost, overhead reductions, things like that, but 
kind of screams to me a little bit that it is not to speak for Tyson in any way, shape, or form. But I think they're feeling some pricing pressures, not just on CO2, obviously, but all aspect, grain, feed, everything we talked about, that's all pricing and uh, ammonia pricing that goes into the fertilizers, that goes into feed. Really, everybody knows the inflation in this market right now. So so what else are we doing? What are we doing? You talked about the snow hood. What else are we doing for efficiency use of CO2? Well, and that's that's a great point. So you look at any of these plants and they're they're processing roughly 2 million birds a week. It, I mean, that's you could have plants yeah. you could have plants doing more than that, less than that, but say an average plant might be 2 million birds a week. So if you can save 1%. Yeah. You know, in 1% in, of CO2 or 1% of the actual production of that meat what outgoing okay. outgoing through the plant uh so big thing with transporting poultry you've got water weight within within that product uh you want to retain that water weight because that's what you're billing uh it could be an internal external customer uh but the point is you want to maintain as much weight of the bird as you can uh, through that transportation so cost yield how much how many yield. pounds of weight am i weight of meat am i shipping so I believe you got a product you were talking about earlier. It's called Combo Chiller. What does that do? When we talk about efficiency and yield and all that, what, what are you what are you hearing from the customers? So, so when when you're filling any combo box with product, whether it's beef, chicken, uh, pork, what you want to do is you want to eliminate any temperature stratification within that box the best you can. You want an even cooling of CO2 over that product uh, to retain that water weight during transportation. So our combo chiller uh, takes that as, as the meat is distributed into that combo box. It's got a rotating horn on it that distributes the meat evenly through the box versus what you'll see a lot of times in plants is the conveyor just dumps in the middle and the, and the meat just stacks up and comes off. And you've got to have a guy with a shovel that's, you know, kind of moving the meat around, shoveling pellets in. So you'll literally see combo boxes sitting on the production line that have huge cold spots on them, huge warm spot on the other side. So you know there's just extreme stratification of, of temperature throughout that box. The combo chiller eliminates that. As the meat goes in, spread in the box, we dose snow right behind that. Uh, so you have a nice thin layer of snow over all the meat, even temperature distribution, and much higher yield on the product. So it sounds like you know, you've know you come in, you've walked through these facilities, and you've identified solutions to help have less of the need to shovel on ice. Less, Absolutely. Less of the human error. It's warm here. We want to get rid of the calibrated shovel. Right. That's, yeah, no, that's going away for good. Calibrated shovel. <laughs> so, patented that? No, yeah, trade no, that. Right. You know, he's, he, he, we're doing away with that patent. You can get it at Ace Hardware. <laughs> <laughs> so it makes me wonder, though, like, are you getting a lot of requests, you know, from your partners, people you have relationships with to kind of come in and do an internal audit and say, okay, Trey, you know, you helped us here. Like you mentioned CO2 from start to finish in mm -hmm. the process. Where else can we be more efficient? What can we do? Any R and D around that? I mean, is there yeah. an interest in continued improvement in other parts of the plant? I, I think that's, that's what we're seeing right now. And it's, it's sort of a, uh, goes back to that saying this, uh, invention is mother's a necessity of invention. Mother is a necessity. I don't think that's it. I don't know what go, it is. Hey, you can go ahead that and one. go ahead and trademark that one. Too. <laughs> that. Mother is a necessity. Necessity, we'll necessity is the mother of invention. That makes that's a lot it. more that sense. That makes yeah. a little bit more sense. Yeah. Yeah. Other than other than your mom being. You know, oh, okay. And, We're done with the mom jokes. <laughs> hey, so, thank goodness you're in new product development with mothers. With something I'm not sure. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what we what we are seeing is is because of the squeeze, the shortage of CO2, the shortage of manpower, we are seeing that uh, our customers take a hard look at where they can make improvements, no matter how small it is. Because again, 1% over yeah. 2 million birds yeah. a week, I mean, that's that's a significant number. Uh, so what we've done with the snow hood, uh, we've, we've put a barcode scanner on it. We can actually scan the box, tell exactly what's in what product is in that box, how much weight is in that box, what the date is, and we can actually dose snow into that box on the fly based on exactly what that product is. Hmm. That didn't exist six months ago. Oh, that's awesome. So yeah, That's great. That's great. Well, real quick, just to close it out, I think we're going to have a, a broader conversation about this. This is probably a whole other episode, but what are, you, what are you seeing in nitrogen? So uh, it's some of those applications that you talked about. Now, if it's making ice, you can't do that with nitrogen. Right. But the blending, some of the freezing, are there are the utilizations or usages of nitrogen in these plants? 
And, you know, what are you seeing? What's the trends going on there? Like, I think this is a bigger conversation, but real it, quick. It's a bigger say? conversation, but what, what plants want to be ready for now is with a shortage of CO2, with that market being as volatile as it is, they want, they want the ability to go from nitrogen to CO2 with a flick of a switch. Yeah. So that's, that's what we're seeing. So we call it like a dual yeah. gas type of system. Yeah. That's, yeah. yeah I mean, cause one of the fears is, you know, yeah, we have a CO2 shortage, so everybody I think it's kind of knee jerk and said, we need to be on nitrogen. But that's, you know, and that's not a... Is there enough nitrogen in the market to support that? No. Are we going to have a nitrogen shortage right. if we, so everybody you, converts? You can trade your shortage. Absolutely. So yeah. Yeah, I like that. So if, you, if you're able to use both gases, you know, would, would follow the trend. Where if you have CO2 in your market or it's cheaper, go to CO2. Have nitrogen in your market, go to nitrogen. Cool. No, I, I, I'm excited to dive into that one because I would love to understand where can you use nitrogen and where do you have to be agnostic to CO2. But... That gives us one more episode in our queue. We're going to make it to number 11, that means for sure. So I'm excited about it. I don't think that's number 11, though. Oh, absolutely not. No, I, we joke. We've got we, we got 100 more of these. Come on. <laughs> I'm sure you think we're going to step away from 100. the camera? No way. It's too much fun. So. No, so, all right. Well, appreciate it. Summarize. Biggest trends you see. Manpower shortages, CO2 shortages. Tightening squeeze on margins and and dual gas conversions. Automation. Kind of yeah. So you're kind of on the leading forefront. Well, man, we really appreciate you coming in and talking to us about this stuff. Thanks. I got to head to the airport. Head to the airport <laughs> yeah. to go take care of manpower shortages That's and right. conversions. Yeah. Nice. No. Don't forget to pack your, uh, what's, what's the shovel? Calibrated. The calibrated, calibrated shovel. shovel. You check okay. that? I think you have to check that. It is a check bag. Okay. Otherwise, it might be used as a weapon. True. Facts. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. We'll see you for 11.